Hello. This lecture is about the effect of compressibility on the performance of airfoils. And more in particular, we will focus on the flow condition for a Mach number called the critical Mach number. We know by now that the velocity on the suction side of the airfoil of a wing at a moderate angle of attack is higher than the speed of the incoming flow. As an example, here you can see an airfoil moving through air with a Mach number of 0.3 at a certain angle of attack. The flow velocity over the airfoil suction side increases and at some point the maximum velocity or the highest local Mach number or in other terms the minimum pressure coefficient Cp- is reached. In this example, at this angle, this is for a Mach number of 0.44 and a Cp of around minus 1.7. If we now increase the flow speed, also the Mach number at this point will go up. At Mach is 0.5, it will have reached a value of 0.78. And at Mach is 0.6, for the first time the flow over the airfoil suction side will reach the speed of sound and will go sonic. This Mach number of 0.6 is called the critical Mach number. The associated minimum pressure coefficient is called the critical pressure coefficient. Please note that this is just an example. Another airfoil will, with a different shape, at a different angle of attack, will likely have a different critical Mach number and at a different location on the airfoil. A comparable graph can be made for one airfoil at different lift coefficients. Now let us look at the influence of the shape of an airfoil and more in particular at the impact of the airfoil thickness. Generally, increasing the upper surface thickness will result in higher local velocities closer to the speed of sound. We know that the CP distribution more or less shows the local overspeed squared. So higher upper surface velocities mean more negative CPs. So at the same flight speed, these thicker airfoils will have higher local Mach numbers on the suction side of the airfoil, and consequently they will have a lower critical Mach number. And this is shown in the following graph. For a flat plate with no speed up over the surface, the critical Mach number is equal to the free stream Mach number, so M critical is 1. If we go up in thickness, the critical Mach number goes down, as is shown by the points on the curve. Also shown is the effect of compressibility according to the prontal glauert correction, so with increasing Mach number the Cp, and obviously also the minimum Cp, goes to more negative values. For each of the four examples, the critical Cp has a different value. There is a relation between the critical Cp on an airfoil and the critical Mach number that connects the points on these CP, CP lines. How can we derive it? OK, let us uh, first write uh, the CP a little differently. And the definition of CP is P minus P infinity divided by Q infinity. But we can also write this as P infinity divided by Q infinity times P divided by P infinity minus 1. Now, let us concentrate a bit here on this Q infinity. So Q infinity is half rho V infinity squared. And this V infinity squared can also be written as M infinity squared times A infinity squared. So, this follows that Q infinity is half rho infinity M infinity squared A infinity squared. Now, we also have a, a relation of A with R and T and P and rho. So, A infinity squared is gamma times P infinity divided by rho infinity. So and if we combine these two, then we have Q is half M infinity squared gamma P infinity. So 
we have um, CP is P infinity divided by Q infinity times P divided P infinity minus 1. And if we fill in for this Q the relation we just found, we get CP is 2 times P infinity divided by M infinity squared gamma P infinity times P divided by P infinity minus 1. Now, P infinity is in the numerator and the denominator, so we have CP is 2 divided by M infinity squared gamma times P divided by P infinity minus 1. But also for this P divided by P infinity, we can use the second uh, version of the isentropic relations. Uh, if we write um, Pt divided by P is 1 plus gamma minus 1 divided by 2 m squared to the power gamma divided by gamma minus 1. Uh, this this Pt, if we bring the flow isentropically to rest, we have the total pressure like in a stagnation point of a wing. But we can also write Pt divided by P infinity is 1 plus gamma minus 1 divided by 2 m infinity squared to the power of gamma divided by gamma minus 1. Now, if we divide those two, then we have P divided by P infinity is 1 plus half gamma minus 1 m infinity squared divided by 1 plus a half gamma minus 1 m squared to the power gamma divided by gamma minus 1. Now, this we can insert in the equation for CP. CP is 2 divided by gamma m infinity squared times 1 plus a half gamma minus 1 m infinity squared divided by 1 plus a half gamma minus 1 m squared to the power gamma divided by gamma minus 1 minus 1. And this is a general relation between the CP and the Mach number at a specific location on the airfoil surface and the free stream Mach number. For M is 1, the Mach number is the critical Mach number and the CP is the critical pressure coefficient. So finally, this is the relation for the critical pressure coefficient and the critical Mach number. And if we now go back to the graph, we see that the points on the CP lines are connected with this new relation. We found a general expression for the critical Mach number and the critical CP, and we have an airfoil dependent relation for the CP. The intersection gives us the critical Mach number for our airfoil. Now, what happens if we have reached the critical Mach number and we would still increase the flow speed? Locally, a region with supersonic flow will start to develop, which will spread to the leaning edge with still increasing Mach number and since also on the lower side of the airfoil locally the velocities are higher than the free stream velocity, also the lower surface will show pockets of supersonic flow. At some point, shocks will appear. Over a shock wave, the pressure increases. So the flow will see an adverse pressure gradient, which will get bigger with increasing shock severity. The boundary layer will separate when the shock is big enough, creating a high pressure drag. The Mach number at which this rise in drag starts is called the Mach number for drag divergence. If we further increase the Mach number, the drag rises rapidly until the free stream Mach number has reached the value of 1. And the flow over this entire airfoil is supersonic. This rapid drag rise due to the forming of shocks 
was the reason that initially people thought that there was no end to this drag rise, and they called it the sound barrier. However, as you can see in this picture, when the flow over the airfoil is entirely supersonic, it reduces again due to a combination of shock and expansion waves. You simply need to generate enough thrust to overcome this high drag rise. The conclusion is that to avoid heavy shocks on the suction side of the airfoil for a specific lift coefficient, we need to restrict the upper surface thickness. However, we also need strength and stiffness in a wing, which requires enough building height. And we need sufficiently high flight Mach numbers. There is a way to accomplish this without the high drag associated with upper surface shocks. Supercritical airfoils. These airfoils have supersonic velocity over a large part of the upper surface, but slightly above the critical CP, so that heavy shocks will be avoided. That is why they are relatively flat on the suction side. The thickness is now shifted to the lower side. To compensate for the loss of lift due to the restricted upper surface CP, some aft loading has been introduced at the pressure side, which gives the typical S-shape of the lower surface. This slide gives a good example of the difference between a conventional airfoil and a supercritical airfoil at high subsonic speed. Both generate the same lift, but the supercritical airfoil only has weak shocks and a much lower drag. Apart from using thin airfoils, another way to increase the drag divergence Mach number is wing sweep. Here you can see a straight wing with a certain airfoil giving a critical Mach number of 0.7. If we now sweep the wing, for instance with an angle lambda of 40 degrees, the speed that the wing sees, so to speak, is not the full velocity vector, but a component V cosine lambda. This means that all velocities over the wing are reduced, and consequently the critical Mach number is increased, in this case to 0.91. We can also look at it from a different perspective, if the straight wing in forward flight would have an airfoil relative thickness of 14%, then, if we apply a sweep angle of 45 degrees, for instance, the airfoil relative thickness in flight direction will change, since the absolute thickness remains the same and the cord length increases. In this case, the airfoil relative thickness decreases to 10%. We know now that thinner airfoils generate higher critical Mach numbers so wing sweep helps in this respect. There's just one downside to this. Wing sweep lowers the lift force for the same span, since the velocity component normal to the leading edge is smaller than the free stream velocity. In the next lecture, we will concentrate on the difference in performance of two-dimensional airfoils and finite wings. <laughs>